welcome uh, to this event on Counting the Divide. Uh, it's an event hosted by the London School of Economics International Inequalities Institute. Um, and I'm Faiza Shaheen. I am a visiting professor at the Institute and also a course tutor in the sociology department. We did have a slight technical problem um, just kicking off today, which is why we're a bit late. Um, so I'm just gonna hang on one more minute as I see these numbers going up in terms of participants. Great, okay, I am going to start because there's so much to get through. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Faisal Shaheen. I'm a visiting professor in practice at uh, the London School of Economics and International Inequalities Institute, and a course chair in the sociology department. And I'm also a non-resident fellow at New York University's Center on International Cooperation. And very pleased to be joined by, uh, with Jayati, Professor, um, Jati Gosh and Professor uh, Chico Ferreira um, from LSE. Um, we are waiting on one more speaker. We've just we just had a few signing in problems, it seems. Um, so um, the Professor Gabriel Palmer. Um, so hopefully he will join us any minute. But let me just do a quick introduction to this very important event. Um, and the timing um, of it is crucial. And we did this on purpose. We organized it quite last minute and um, in part because we wanted to do it before the annual meetings of the World Bank um, and the IMF which is happening next week in Marrakesh um, and this really important subject of measurement is very very much on the agenda. Um, we meet at a time when inequality of course um, in many countries has been rising, but also global inequalities, the difference between countries, inequalities between countries has seen a rise um, since COVID for the first time in decades. Um, you know, those of us that have worked on inequality for a long time, um, you know, know that it was not given much attention um, in the, for a long time until really the early, um, uh, kind of 2010 onwards um, or after the financial crash. Uh, and then many of us were engaged in a battle um, or a discussion uh, at the UN and at the World Bank as we moved from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. And as the World Bank took on new measures uh, of um, shared prosperity, as it was called. Now, many of us were super pleased at the time to see um, goals on inequality adopted at the international level to see the World Bank move towards talking much more about inequality and have a measure of shared prosperity. Um, but, you know, as always, um, you know, the battle was not fully won and measurement is one of the issues that has really come up um, since then, um, both within the Sustainable Development Goals and the Shared Prosperity Measure um, chose to look at the bottom 40% compared to the average. Now, um, that doesn't measure inequality at the very top of societies. It doesn't really call that out. Um, and we've kind of failed in the account accountancy of what's happened at the very top of the income spectrum and the wealth spectrum, certainly um, across our measurement. And when you don't have that accountancy, you all, it's also difficult to get the accountability. So today um, in this event, we're gonna be talking about the substantive elements of measurement, but also the need for action. Um, and so this isn't just a, a geeky conversation about measurement at all. This is real life. These are um, inequalities that matter in people's everyday lives. These are inequalities that people are very angry about um, at the national and international level. Um, and we know also that, um, that without proper measures of inequality, um, we are not gonna see the sorts of reductions in, in um, carbon. Um, we're gonna see a kind of climate action that perhaps makes things more unequal. If we just don't ma measure inequality, it will affect other areas of the sustainable development agenda. So um, I am gonna move on to the speakers um, and uh, as we get into this, and please do note, do note there's a Q&A um, box, you can write any questions that you have um, there um, as the discussion goes on and I will come back to them. So we're still waiting on Professor Palmer 
Um, hopefully he will join us any minute. So I will move first to um, Chico, um, Professor Francisco Ferreira, who's the Amata Sen Professor of Inequality Studies and Director of the International Inequalities Institute at LSE. Um, he is also affiliated scholar with the Stone Center at the City University of New York um, and a non-resident fe resident fellow at the Institute for the Study of Labor. I should also say he does have this long background at the World Bank, so we might pick on you a bit, Chico, to kind of um, to help us understand the kind of politics of maybe what's going on there. Um, so let me hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Faiza. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks to, to everyone for, for joining. I see some old old friends' names on the, on the list of attendees. Let me um, share my screen, uh, but also uh, but also say that um, you know our plan was to have uh, Professor Palma, Professor Gabriel Palma, go go first, and so and he has an enormous amount of uh, uh, stuff uh, information uh, on uh, levels and trends of inequality. So. Um, I don't have any, um, uh, and that was because he was going to provide that. What I will talk about briefly is this question here. Why the World Bank? Can you see, can people see the, um, if maybe Peter or Pfizer could let me know, can people see the, the screen? I can see it, yeah. Great, thanks. So the question is uh, that I'm trying to address is why the World Bank should include a measure of inequality, it's proper measure just of inequality in its corporate scorecard. And, you know, I guess there's some um, analog for the UN, which I know less well. Uh, they don't have a corporate scorecard, but they should also be monitoring the development of inequality. And so uh, if you go to the website of the World Bank Group's development scorecard, it has three tiers. The first one is called development context. And a quote from the website is, it's supposed to report on long-term development outcomes that countries are achieving, right? It sounds very plausible that inequality would be one of these. Okay? Then there are two other tiers, client results, which are about the results of operations that the World Bank supports, and then a tier three on the bank's own performance, looking at the bank's operational and organizational effectiveness. So, so clearly, if we wanted the, the bank to monitor inequality, it would not be under tiers two or three, it would be under tier one, okay, which is the development context. Now, as we know, inequality is, is not there per se, a measure of inequality. So what is there? Well, first, there are the two goals. So there are many things the banks, the bank measures and reports on in the scorecard, but two of these are its supposed twin goals that President Jim Kim introduced a, a while back, and which apparently are still still there. One is just the population living under the international poverty line, and another uh, is uh, the median growth rate of consumption or income per capita of the bottom forty percent. This is the share prosperity goal. So this is the global poverty goal, and this is the share prosperity goal uh, that the bank. Uh, uh, worked on. There is a variant of this. There's a third one, uh, which I'll come back to later. But in addition to the two goals, you know, they monitor growth rate of GDP per capita, GDP per person employed, non-agriculture sectors value added as a share of GDP, value added per worker in agriculture, youth employment, legal changes that increase gender equality, some measure of financial inclusion, population of access to electricity, and indeed, another nine human capital indicators, seven resilience and sustainability indicators. SIG, by the way, is sustainable and inclusive growth, which is this first category here. Then there are, uh, you know, there are eight of these plus the three, the three uh, targets. These two and a variant. Nine human capital indicators, seven indicators of resilience and sustainability, three of in institutional capacity which adds up to 30 indicators, which include things like a country's statistical performance, indicators of the performance of statistical institutes, or uh, marine protected areas as a share of territorial waters. Okay, and a wide range of, 
of things like that, all of which are important, and I'm not saying we shouldn't monitor them, uh, but the question is, what about inequality? Now, what's been going on recently is that there is a, a debate, I think, within the bank. And I, you know, I, I used to be at the bank, but I'm not anymore, and I'm not really privy to what's going on. Um, but there seems to be um, a conversation about changing this share prosperity goal. And the, the latest version of that that I've seen is this uh, proposal for a prosperity gap. Uh, which is something that Art Cray, Christoph Lachner, Berk Osler, Benoit de Cerf, Dean Jolliffe, um, uh, uh, Olivier Sterk, uh, and uh, Jonsen have, have come up with. Uh, it's this thing. So um, Pfizer said a little bit of geekiness was allowed. So what this is, is just um, a ratio of a prosperity standard to the incomes below that prosperity standard added up and averaged, right? So this is the average factor by which individual income should rise if we wanted everybody to have a prosperity uh, level Z. It's a bit like a poverty measure, really. Um, but if you set Z as a, some standard of prosperity that you'd like everyone to have, then this is, you know, by how much, by what factor, by what multiple should incomes increase to, to get to that? The nice thing about this is that unlike the poverty gap, which is a difference, or uh, this 40% thing that you know makes very little sense really when you think about it, that, we, that the bank had been following before, this has a very nice uh, sensitivity to incomes where the sensitivity is much higher if you're poorest, right? So if you have Z over here, the prosperity gap, um, you know, the poorer you are, the bigger your, your weight in this index. So it's a very pro-poor measure. It satisfies not only the, the core axiom of inequality, the Pigou Dalton transfer principle, but also it's more sensitive to transfers at the bottom of the distribution than later on. It's also subgroup decomposable. So I'm not gonna be too nerdy going forward. Um, I just wanna say in my view, this is a big improvement over the mean or median growth rate at the bottom 40%. And I hope the bank will choose to replace the share prosperity goal with this measure, which I think is very nice. Now, by the way, I, I think I've spied some of the authors uh, of this paper in the audience. So if there are questions about this, I'll, I'll defer to them. Um, but so this is, this, is, this is quite nice, but it's not an inequality measure, right? And surely, I argue some measure of income inequality does belong in this list in, in tier one, the development context as a sustainable uh, and inclusive growth indicator, uh, separately from the share prosperity goal and these other ones. And I'm gonna spend the rest of my time just uh, telling you briefly why I think that's the case, probably not needed in this audience, but I will tell you my views on why that's the case. The first one is that people actually, people care intrinsically about fairness and equity and inequality. Pfizer said many people are angry about the inequality. And even the people who are not angry about inequality of incomes typically value some sense of inequality of opportunity or rather equality of opportunity. People want mobility. People want the ability for the children of poor parents to have opportunities like the children of rich parents have. Uh, and what you got here in this picture is just the correlation, the association between income inequality on this axis and a measure of inequality of opportunity over here. And this looks the same if you had a measure of intergenerational mobility here. In fact, when it was th this graph was first done in 2013, and in the same year, um, um, uh, Miles Korak had. Uh, a, 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 a graph just like this, but with mobility here and uh, intergenerational elasticity of income here. And then this curve became ga gained a name, the Great Gatsby curve in, in his case. Uh, and, and what's important about it is it says, even if you say, well, I don't care about outcome inequality, but I do care about mobility, I do care about equal opportunities, then you know they're very closely correlated. It's very hard to fight one without fighting the other. And so a measure of, of inequality 
uh, even of outcomes, is of intrinsic interest uh, and, and people care about. Second, and this is a particularly important reason why we should also focus on inequality at the top, which the, the shared prosperity, the prosperity gap measure in its censored form, which I think is the one that would be adopted, doesn't. And that is that inequality, particularly at the top, can lead to elite capture. In fact, we have observed this both in little villages in Ecuador, uh, in communities in India, and you know, in the United States uh, as a country, uh, you know, and in many, many other places. Uh, and 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 there's a lot of economic theory about this. I'm mentioning just two papers here by by well-known economists like Darana Samoglu and James Robinson, or well-known economic historians like Engerman and Sokolov. The argument is if you have very unequal control over resources, then that inequality in economic power will lead to political inequality, inequality in political power, and will develop bad political institutions that lead to exclusionary or, or extractive economic institutions, which in turn lead to persisting inequality and worse outcomes, and therefore a cycle uh, begins. This is very much the spirit of these, these two papers here, um, one more theoretical, the other quite historical. Uh, but the point is, it doesn't take you know a very complex model for us to be persuaded that we observe in the world at large that countries with societies with very large levels of inequality in, in, in income end up having inequality in wealth and then end up having inequality in political influence, in voting behavior, in campaign finance. That affects the quality uh, of political institutions and economic decision making. This is an important reason to monitor inequality across the entire distribution, because it does affect the development context in which uh, countries operate, and the bank and the UN should pay attention to that. Uh, in addition, we also know that inequality is pretty inefficient, and I say here most likely bad for growth. Many of you in the audience will you know, know that there's a a long and often inconclusive literature on the macroeconomic association between inequality and growth. But be that as it may, be, be this uh, literature inconclusive as it may, there's you know, growing evidence of microeconomic evidence of misallocation of resources, misallocation of capital, misallocation of opportunities when there is, uh, when there is a great deal of inequality of wealth and uh, and 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 uh, and capital markets aren't perfect, including a lot of wasted human potential, human opportunities, children that go stunted, children that don't go to school, girls that don't stay in school as much as they like, huge amounts of wasted human potential and economic potential as a consequence because of inequality, right? And so there is some evidence uh, also that that this inequality of opportunity. Is, is bad for growth. There's this study by these two Spanish economists um, looking at the US uh, over a few decades, which suggests that uh, uh, states in the US where a larger share of inequality is inherited from your family or due to your race have grown less over you know, four decades uh, from the 1960s onwards. So, so in addition to elite capture, inequality is also bad for growth because of misallocation of resources. And, and that's you know determining growth. But for any particular growth rate, we also know that inequality makes growth less effective in reducing poverty. This here is an old graph from a world development report I worked on when I was at the bank very long ago. It shows this kind of growth elasticity of poverty, which is by how much does poverty fall if GDP per capita grows by 1%. So you want this number to be negative. You want it to be, you know, poverty falls a lot. Okay? Now, when you see this elasticity plotted against the initial Gini coefficient, it's a very upward sloping relationship. Growth is much more effective at reducing poverty in the Chinas and Laos and Romanias of the world where inequality is relatively low than it is in the Guatemalas and, and South Africa's and Brazil's of the world. Uh, so not only is inequality likely to constitute an obstacle to the efficient allocation of resources and economic growth, it also uh, uh, reduces the effect of growth on, on, on poverty, the power of growth to reduce poverty. So let me, let me conclude 
you know, we've come a long way from the days when inequality, when I joined the World Bank uh, 30 years ago or however long, no, not quite 30, 28 years ago, you know, inequality was, economists didn't like talking about inequality. It was a bit of a peripheral consideration. Other social sciences were already very active on inequality, but economists uh, were a little more hesitant. Now, this is not the case at all. It's widely seen as unfair. It's widely seen as an obstacle to good institutions, as a retardant to social economic development. And social economic development is the objective of the World Bank. Inequality matters enormously. I mean, it matters at least as much as, you know, something like marine protected areas. Uh, nothing against marine protected areas. I'm all for more marine protected areas. But if you're trying to understand development context, you must include inequality in this list, okay, if you're including things like this, okay. In addition, the bank has the analytical capacity, um, uh, you know, excellent economists there, uh, uh, experts in the measurement of, of inequality. A lot of the data, not all, and we could discuss um, issues of data, particularly on top incomes uh, and the combination of data from top incomes with household surveys, but it has some of the data needed to lead that conversation, okay? So let me end this, my last slide with a specific suggestion. So I think, um, as I said before, the bank hopefully will replace this median growth rate of consumption amongst the bottom 40% with the prosperity gap that Art Cray, Christoph Lachner, and, and their colleagues, of you know, Olivier Sterk, uh, who had a, a big role to play in that paper. They, uh, th that is a much better measure. As I said, it's the average factor, average multiple by which incomes below some prosperity standard must rise. It has all the nice properties for that. It should also replace the variant of the goal number two, which is there in the scorecard, which is countries with growth concentrated in the bottom 40%. When you look at the definition of that in the World Bank scorecard, it is countries where the growth in the bottom 40% is both positive and higher than the growth in the average income. So it, it was meant to capture the sort of inequality sensitive pro poor growth. Well, it's, you know, it's still not gonna capture anything about inequality at the top about elite capture and so on. So let's replace it with a proper measure of income inequality, the Gini coefficient, the Palma ratio, you know, I'll let the people at the bank choose the right one. Um, you know, it should be moved to the sustainable and inclusive growth group rather than the goal, the goals area. But um, I really hope that uh, bank leadership and the UN will do that. So let me end there. And uh, as soon as I find out how to do it, I'll stop sharing. Uh, uh, but um, that's it for me. Uh... Many thanks, Chico, and we will come back to you. And it's it's so helpful to see that run through of what the new um, potential measure is on the prosperity gap, and and also to make the case as to why we need to measure the very top. Um, you know, this is about state capture. This is about a really important aspect of why we see the damage that we see in democracies and growth uh, in social mobility. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's that I always think about as well as someone that has to publicly communicate a lot of these things as well is that, you know, sometimes these measures as great and as smart as they can be that don't make sense to most people out there. You know, you showed us that equation. Sounds great. Um, but how many people are really going to understand that? And the beauty of measures, say, like Palmer's index, which takes the top 10% to the bottom 40%, is that it's immediately understandable, um, you know, that ratio between what is being earned or the wealth held at the top 10% versus the bottom 40%. Um, I know uh, Professor Palmer is going to join us hopefully very shortly, but I'm just going to hand over now to Professor Professor Gosh, who is so lucky to have with us, and she's a professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts, um, Amherst, um, and I'm a huge fan, so looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you very much, Faiza, and thanks so much, Chico, also for uh, introducing that topic so well. I I really wish uh, that Gabriel were, were here because he has done so much work on these measures and particularly on the inequality in measured by Palma ratio, which I believe is one of the more important ratios, as you just mentioned, for obvious reasons. 
So I want to really talk about, uh, which is why I wish I could have followed Gabrielle, but I really want to talk about the kinds of measures we need. And I think, you know, Chico had a very interesting idea for a different kind of shared prosperity indicator. But there's a reason why inequality is an issue beyond shared prosperity. One of them definitely has to do with elite capture, as Faiza, you've just mentioned, with the fact that the top 10% tend to then be able to disproportionately influence both political and economic policies in ways that uh, cause them to benefit even further over time. But also, I want to highlight that we need to be measuring more than just within country inequality. So there are a couple of things we need to look at. The uh, measure of shared prosperity, which is a very national measure, is not really focused on inequality per se. It doesn't measure the rich. The second is that when we're looking at global inequality, we do have to look at the between country inequality as well. There is a lot of evidence that it went down significantly in the period, let's say, from the turn of the century till before the pandemic, approximately. And that a large part of this was led by a certain relatively small number of but highly populous countries, China and India typically named, but a bunch of other Asian and other uh, countries that are now called emerging markets. But we also know that since then, there is very significant evidence that this has not continued in the same way. And if we exclude China, there is every indication that there has been a significant increase in between country inequality. But we're not even tracking that as part of SDG 10. And that's important. We do not bother about the things we do not track. If you don't have the metrics for something, it ends up being ignored in policy discussions. So I think one very important thing that we really do need to do is once again, go back to measuring the between country inequality, particularly for countries that are now suffering the sort of multiple uh, crises of not just climate change, but debt distress and uh, you know the impact of macroeconomic policies of the advanced countries and so on. So definitely we have to add a between country indicator. We also have to add wealth inequality. And here again, you know, shared prosperity is meaningless. We really have to talk about inequality. We have to look at the Gini ratio and ideally the Palma ratio for wealth. Fortunately, we now have much better data uh, relying on the World Inequality Lab and a bunch of others. It's still not perfect, of course, but much better than we have had in the past. If we can even try and get some estimates of the wealth of the top 10%, even forgetting about looking at all the rest of the population, but comparing the wealth of the top 10% with the known availability of assets and so on, that is an important tracker for how much the extremely wealthy have benefited from particular systems and policies and regulatory practices and it is something which can then be used for not just policy advocacy, but it can be used by everyone in the in economy and society to say, well, what is this particular strategy giving us in terms of greater concentration of wealth or reduced concentration of wealth? The possibilities of wealth taxation also become much more significant and possible, plausible, once you do have the data, especially for extreme wealth. So I think wealth inequality is another aspect that we really do have to highlight and we have to track much more. But now to get back to the issue of the income inequality, we have to also remember that most of the data the World Bank is using is, are, is based on consumption surveys in many of the countries. And these consumption surveys are uh, well known to underestimate uh, the incomes of the rich. First of all, because the rich do not spend all of their income. Oh, I'm so delighted that Gabrielle has joined us. Congratulations on making it, Gabrielle. And I am going to actually um, reduce what I talk about because I do believe it's so important for Gabrielle to be able to place some of his estimates uh, here for everyone to see. But I just want to highlight that the Palma ratio is particularly good in recognizing if you like beneficiaries of particular strategies or even beneficiaries of different kinds of shocks and outcomes. And that's something that we do need to track because if we're not tracking it, we're not doing something about it. The need for an indicator that is easily 
available, relatively easily available for that we can get for many countries without great difficulty and that we can track on a reasonably regular basis is something essential. I think that this is available for both Gini and Palma indices. And I think it's really important for the SDG goal to contain those indicators because leaving them out means we are excluding the real purpose of having that indicator at all. The purpose of that was not in just you know raising the bottom. In fact, the elimination of extreme poverty, the elimination of hunger, these are about raising the extreme bottom. The need to have an SDG goal at all for tracking inequality was really to track inequality. That is looking at the rich just as much as you look at the poor. And I would argue it's possibly more important now to look at the rich than the poor. But I will possibly come back with questions. I really am looking forward to hearing Gabrielle talk about these issues. So thanks. Thank you, Jati. And, I, you know, I, just listening to both you and to Chico, there's a real question here of why we're not measuring these things, right? What's the politics here? Um, Could I just add uh, one, one oh, go ahead. quick? The answer is elite capture. It doesn't only happen in governments. It also happens in global institutions. <laughs> Absolutely, right? So it's kind of like the prophecy of inequality, really, you know, the point is, is that they don't want to be shown. And so therefore... The numbers don't reflect that and interesting on wealth on uh, a good point there on between country inequalities but i would also add that we've really failed on this promise in the sustainable development goal agenda to leave no one behind and to capture the data about which groups you know women not just women but different ethnic groups regions etc that are left behind um and that data is barely even connected uh, collected in in many countries and there is a big point here about the politics of why this is not happening. Um, saying that, so excited to be uh, joined by Professor Palmer, um, whose work, Jayati mentioned it there, and I've looked at as a lot. I think the Palmer ratio gives us a real opportunity to be able to measure and point to inequalities in a much more transparent way, in a way that people could understand and grasp. Um, so let me hand it over to Professor Palmer. Welcome. Well, after uh, 50 minutes trying to connect because of some problems uh, with this, the way they organized the Zoom meeting, uh, we finally managed to, to sort that and I'm connected. Um, I need to, to share my, the screen. Um, I think that should be fine. Yeah. Yeah, we can see that. Okay. Uh, as I understand it, what we, I mean, unfortunately, I didn't hear what the previous speakers um, were talking about. So I may repeat some of the ideas. So, and unfortunately, I cannot really follow the the uh, what has been discussed before. Uh, as I understand it, the crucial issue is uh, is on measuring inequality. I mean, uh, as we will see in the presentation, uh, and as I'm sure it has already been said, uh, there are serious. We have serious uh, problems with the way we measure inequality and also very contradictory messages according to which is the way that um, or what we are measuring and which is the way we are measuring. Meaning what we need today, today mostly is some way to harmonize the different ways that we measure inequality. And this is what I'll try to, to discuss today. Um, the key ideas, as many people know, is that inequality is a choice. And as, um, as John Paul Sartre uh, used to say, there is nothing that reveals better who you are as an individual or as a society than the choices uh, you make. Uh, this is what really identifies uh, who you are as either individual or society. 
and none more than the inequality that you choose to have. In that sense, uh, as I have argued before, uh, in a way, every country deserves the inequality it has. Now, the first part, very quickly, I'm going to go through four stylized facts of inequality uh, to move into the second type of uh, problem of measurement, because also we need to know what we should be measuring. Now, the first one is the most obvious one, is that inequality is highly unequal across countries. If you look at the traditional Gini coefficient and you, you simply rank all the countries in the world according to their level of inequality, you have countries below 25 and others which are close to 65. For those of you that may not be familiar with the Gini is basically, it has two characteristics. One is an index of overall inequality. And second, it goes from zero perfect equality to one perfect inequality. So the range of inequality that we actually have in the world, it really cannot be greater than what it is. And second, there is very practically no regularity. There are countries rich in natural resources as the most equal and in the most unequal. There are countries that has uh, democracies and, and semi-democracies and dictatorship on both ends, meaning that really what uh, the exogenous factors that, as you know, economic theory, not only since, since Kuznets, but since before Kuznets, has always mainstream economic theory has always made every effort in the world to try to identify what will be the exogenous factors that it will tend to determine inequality. Uh, what often they are called the fundamentals. However, I belong to a completely different school, which I think is follows the Ricardian tradition in which inequality is mostly the outcome of the political articulation of conflict between rentier capitalist and labor. And today, of course, bureaucrats, which form a large part of society, and as we'll see in my work, they do play quite an important role in terms of inequality. And in this articulation, what really matters is history, politics, and institutions. It's not that fundamentals don't matter, but history, political institutions often are much more relevant than that. Now, the, basically, the, what I'm going to say today, it's uh, based on three of my uh, work, which in the chat I'm going to uh, call them in a minute, uh, put them there in a minute, so in case anybody wants to check at them. The second stylized fact, which again is very well known, is that if we order countries according to their GDP per capita, there is a huge diversity among middle income countries. And this runs almost completely uh, against the kind of traditional understanding that somehow middle income countries, for different reasons from goodness one onwards, uh, tend to be the one that uh, would have the highest level of inequality. And certainly in Southern Africa, the middle income resource rich in Southern African countries like South Africa, Botswana and Namibia, they surely do, but also the Latin American ones. But also in the middle income uh, country, we have some of the most equal in the world. So clearly is this diversity in the middle, one of the most challenging um, um, tasks ahead, try to understand uh, this, this diversity. And obviously to start with, we need to uh, measure it in a way that we can uh, get something reasonable out, uh, out of that. The third stylized fact, and here we can we enter into terrain which is not uh, immediately obvious, and in, in a way, 
uh, when I first brought it up in my work, uh, I was the first one to be <laughs> the one surprised, is that if we divide every country in the world into two halves, the middle and upper middle, which is the size five to nine, and the rich and poor, the size 10 and one to four, meaning each country is divided in two groups of 50%, uh, two equal groups of the population. And what is quite remarkable is that from this, this incredible high level of diversity, when we do this very simple exercise of dividing each country into two half, what we find is that there is a huge degree of homogeneity across the world in terms of how much this two half of the population uh, they, uh, they appropriate. Furthermore, they tend to be very close to the 50% of national income, meaning each half tend to have half of the pie. Meaning not only there is an incredible degree of homogeneity when we divide the population in these two half, but almost quite a large degree of uh, equality in the sense that each half together tend to have half of the national income. So the only way that we can, we can compatibilize this uh, homogeneity in the two half of the population with the huge heterogeneity in the whole, uh, because how can we move from two half which are highly homogeneous, we mix them into one half, into one total, would end up to be highly diverse. So it has to be the way in which each of these two half distributed among their own members, the half of the pie that collectively they get. And the answer to that and the foundations of the Palmer ratio is here in which that it clearly shows that those in the middle, the administrative classes to follow the institutional and economic or bureaucracy, both in the public and the private sector, they tend to not only as a group get something very close to the 50% of national income, but also they divide among themselves in a quite homogeneous way, the half of the pie that they get overall. The upper middle seven to nine gets roughly 70% of that half. And the middle middle, for, if, if, to, to give them a, uh, or the, the, the traditional middle, the size five to six, they get 30% of that half. So if the rich and poor would do the same with the half they get, they distributed between top 10 and bottom 40 in the same homogeneous way that the middle does, there would be no diversity of inequality in the world. However, as you can see, the rich and the poor, they, they distribute among themselves the half of the pie that they get in the most unequal way. way. There are countries in which the bottom 40 would get as a group a larger share of national income than the top 10, and countries where the top 10 will get nearly the whole of the, that half of the pie that goes to the whole group, leaving literally next to nothing to the bottom 40%. Meaning what we see here is the diversity of inequality in the world is only about what happened in half of the population related to half of the national income. Meaning if what one wants to analyze is diversity of inequality in the world, one should focus only on half of the population, top 10, about on 40, the rich and the poor, and, el, el, and um, well, try to understand what is what determines this extraordinary heterogeneity in which only half of the national income is distributed among only half of the population, which is the rich and the poor. So at least if we think like that, the issue of diversity and what we need to measure more closely and more accurately is much more a focus than what we had um, before. 
also a small point, if this is the case, every econometric exercise ever done that has the genie as the dependent variable, by definition, has a misspecification. Because how can the same set of explanatory variables explain homogeneity in the middle and in the, in the groups of the middle and heterogeneity in the tails? That is obviously logically impossible. It can either explain one or the other. Therefore, if we use the genie with all the advantages it has, the problem with the genie is that it mixes pairs with apples. It mixes how half of the population distributed, distributed that in the half of the pie that they get in a very homogeneous way and the other half in a very heterogeneous way. So the problem with the genie is that it mixes this pair with apple. It's neither one nor the other. So although the genie tries to calculate the whole of the distribution in the country by, I mean, it's not a problem of the genie. The problem is that they're in the real world, half of the population distribute their income in a very homogeneous way and half in very heterogeneous way. So if we mix them, we end up uh, with something which is neither one nor the other. Therefore, uh, in, in econometric works, uh, the use of the genius, the dependent variable is obviously, is, uh, is an instrument, it leads to misspecification. Now, following that, I basically propose an index that if the diversity is what happened between the rich and poor, the top 10 and bottom 40, well, why don't we look at uh, simply what is the chair of the top 10 over the chair of the bottom 40, and we have an index which at least will tell us in the half of the population where there is diversity, what is the characteristic of that diversity. And because of time, very quickly, there are two things which are quite uh, remarkable. One is that the first almost 110 of 130 countries, yes, there is an increase in inequality across the world, but the increase is pretty much linear. I mean, if in the last 20 countries, the same speed of deterioration of inequality will continue, the country in the world with the highest Palmer ratio will be three. In fact, it's South Africa with seven meaning the key of the diversity, even in this half, is only a group of 20, 25 countries, pretty much regionally located, Southern Africa, rich, mineral, uh, mineral rich, middle income, Southern African countries, South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, plus some of Latin American countries. Meaning the key question is who, in terms of diversity of inequality, is why in a very small group of countries, the half of the population that goes to the rich and poor, it, um, it's, it goes so much to the rich and it gets goes so little to the poor. Why there is an explosion of inequality in a rather a, a small group of countries? And that is the key question about diversity. And for that, obviously, we need every possible every possible way to, to measure that properly. Uh, after I proposed that measurement, Coban and Summers label it the Palmer ratio. And the key question is why in those 20, 25 uh, countries inequality explode. Now, the second part and very briefly and very quickly is that at the moment for me, the key empirical challenges ahead for the World Bank, for the UN, and surely for the IMF, because the IMF does uh, play a role in this, particularly in getting out of countries the, their tax returns. Uh, there is no institution that could pressure more countries that, like in Latin America, they refuse to, to, to uh, open uh, in an anonymous, anonymous way their tax return in order that we learn about inequality, there is no other institution as the IMF to put pressure on those countries in order to do so. Now, in the case of Chile, my country of origin, for example, if we look at the, at the 
reach at the share of the top 10 pre-tax, meaning the one of the world income database, the Piketty Group um, a, a study about uh, pre um, the pre-tax, the, the tax returns. And uh, although in Chile we don't have the original data, there are some macro data or some at least uh, data enough in order to calculate the, the share of the top 10. And the characteristic in the last 20 years is that the share of the top 20 has remained complete, very much uh, stable. There has been some movement, but basically we started the period in which the top 10 gets about 63% uh, of national income. And we end up the period in which the top 10 gets like 64% of national income. Now, however, if we look at uh, household surveys, the calculated in Chile and then by the World Bank, the post-tax, post-transference income, we see that there has been a fantastic decline in the share of the top of, of the top uh, of the top ten, the share of the top ten um, has supposedly in household income declined from forty five percent of national income to thirty eight in two thousand and six, and then to thirty six. Now, of course, if there had been some important tax reforms and the government were, ex were capable of taxing the rich. Yes, that would be possible. That uh, at the beginning of the period, um, there was a 18 percentage of GDP difference between what the top 10% gets according to the Piketty Group in terms of their tax return and what they, their disposable income, uh, their, their, their home take, of the top 20%, and the difference would be taxes and transfers. However, that 18% has increased in these 20 years to 28%. In a country that had been no tax reforms of any name, a country that had been no change in, in transference in any significant way, a country in which the, the total tax take is not more than 20%, and we can see that there is a 28 per supposedly a 28 percentage difference between what the pre and post tax income of the top 20% is basically here there is a massive underreporting and the key problem is that we have got rather good at imputing taxes to the bottom 40% because of their free health and their free education, some housing subsidies, meaning countries have increased, certainly Chile, have increased enormously the amount of income they impute to the bottom 40%, but they made no effort to do the same to the top 10%. So supposedly we have a country in which the, the pre-tax income of the top 20% is one of the highest in the world. It's over 60%. I mean, what is left for the other 80% of the population is next to nothing. And supposedly at the same time, there is a fantastic decline of the share of the top 10 in household post-tax and transference income, in which there is no logical reason to explain that. A country that uh, tax returns are pretty regressive in countries where the top 0.001% the billionaires pay the same proportion of income as taxes than people living in the minimum wage and so on and so. So this is basically an error of measurement. This is basically household service not able to capture the income of the top 10%. And that's not very surprising since household service normally capture relatively well income from work, but it doesn't capture income from wealth, income from non-work income from the top 10%. And as everybody knows, the proportion of the income of the top 10 during this last year has increased massive, massively how much the share of the income from wealth 
in their top 10, per, in, in the income of the top 10% rather than work. So basically we have a massive challenge. How do we, the same thing we do to the bottom 40, we have to do to the top 10. How do we use national accounts, tax uh, havens, uh, all sorts of other mechanisms, which are uh, not rocket science, but politically are obviously very explosive. Uh, we could readjust a household returns the income of the top 10 in a way that it really reflects reality in a, in, in a way that is much more um, uh, realistic. And I, and I finish here. If we do exactly, if we show exactly the same, the same uh, graph as before, but we add the Palma ratio, we have period like the three years between 23 and 26, in which the Palma ratio supposedly in Chile fell from 35 to 3.5 to 2.7 at a time in which the share of the top 10% was actually increasing to 65% of GDP. How on earth do you, do you account for that other than a government doing a massive effort to put every possible penny on the share of the 40, but leaving totally untouched the uh, voluntary declaration of the top 10 regarding to their uh, income. So in Chile, in the last 20 years, supposedly, the Palma ratio fell from 4.3 to three five to two seven and then to two three. In the in the meantime, the top ten has continued to earn more than sixty percent of national income. More than sixty goes just to the top ten in a country where total tax take is not more than twenty percent and is highly. Uh, 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 regressive because the most important uh, tax is uh, VAT and so on. So this is simply not possible. So the key tax the, the key tax ahead is that we try to look in equality from every possible pos way, particularly the share of the rich and the poor because that's what diversity exists. But we have to make an effort to harmonize figures pre and post tax figures that a, ma a market income and disposable income, every possible measurement we have, we need to make an effort now to harmonize them. Otherwise, we'll have absurdities like the case in Chile, which it cannot be more obvious that if the top 10% gets 65% of national income, all this massive reduction in the Palma ratio, it only occurs of what is happening in the other 35%. It doesn't make any possible sense. So I think this is the real task ahead. How we harmonize the different ways that we have and improve the different way we have to measure inequality, pre and post tax market is possible and all forms of way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Palmer. That was a real tour de force on, on, on why we need a measure like the Palmer and why it's so much better at, at really capturing the realities of inequalities that we see today and the variation that you talk about there, Professor. And in the excitement of having you on the call, I did a very poor job of introducing you and just to say that you're a press of economics at both Universities of Cambridge and University of Santiago. Um, I was also really struck um, and we've definitely done a lot of graphs, a lot of um, geeking out on the numbers in this in this session. I was also really struck by this point about the underreporting of wealth. So an income at the very, very top. Um, and this is gonna be a real challenge. And um, I'm just, cause there's so much to unpack there. I do wanna cut, bring in um, Chico and Jati, if I can, just to have a kind of quick reaction to what what you've just heard um, and maybe just to pick up this point that is being raised by Matthew Martin um, who's at the Development Finance International and, and, and been doing a lot of work around these issues and measurement um, on 
really the question of resources. So there's the kind of the best measure, the measure that captures inequality in the most meaningful sense. But there's also this problem of how you get this top, right? Because that takes a, a lot of resources and resources that a lot of countries around the world don't have. So even if the political will is there, um, you know, how do we how do we get to the point where we don't have this massive underreporting? Um, Chico, do you want to have a quick reaction and then I'll go to Jayati and please do put your questions in the Q&A box. Maybe Gabrielle, you can also stop sharing so we can see everybody. Thank you. OK. Yeah, yeah I mean, just a just a very quick quick reaction. So it was very nice to see um, what what uh, Gabriel shared. I mean, on this issue of contrasting levels and trends between um, the WID numbers, the sort of Piketty group in Paris and, and the World Bank, I, I want to sound a note of caution, which um, I think most of us who are enthusiasts about fighting inequality don't like. But I think, you know, it's the truth. The truth is that we don't know which one of those numbers. We don't know that there is one of those numbers that is right. So you have to understand what it is that, that the PKT group do here. When you've got France or the US, which the original papers were about, it's or it, it's tax data across the entire distribution. Of course, for Chile, you cannot do that because the bottom half or the bottom 40%, whatever it is, aren't in the tax statistics. And that's certainly true in Brazil, if it's not in Chile. It's certainly true in Brazil. It's, you know, for Africa, that would be the bottom 80%. So what they do is they try to combine tax data, household survey data. That is a lot set, a lot easier said than done. Um, you know, they, they have a, a very nice paper by Blanchet, Flores, and Morgan, uh, which do this, which they try to, to, to combine this, this, uh, this thing. Um, very nice. I was uh, the PhD examiner for one of them. It's very interesting. Full of assumptions. Not at all obvious where the merging point is between the two. There's a new paper by Nora Lustig and others that actually says, actually, you know, depending on how you do that, you get very different rankings across countries and so on. And that's just going, just merging household inc household surveys and tax data. Then there is the further step of adding national accounts. And because, you know, if you're, an, you know, if, if you have a certain ideology, any number that gives you a higher inequality measure, you're like, yeah, yeah that must be right. Well, I mean, I don't know. It's very difficult assumptions being made there as well. So with, with a bunch of co-authors now, Francois Bourguignon, Facundo Alvaredo, who knows how the sausage is made inside out, uh, and uh, Francois Bourguignon, we, we are starting to talk about inequality bands because Gabriel is right. We, now we have huge uncertainty about the actual inequality levels. We know the household surveys are wrong. We know that they ignore the top. They miss the top to a large extent. But we are not sure that these corrections we see are right corrections. There's a lot of assumptions, a lot of uh, uncertainty there. So while we know the numbers are higher than the ones reported by the World Bank now, and this goes back to my presentation, Gabriel, which you missed, where I said the World Bank has much of the data that it needs, but not all. This is precisely what I mean. It doesn't really have yet the data on the top. Uh, and there is no real agreement outside. There's one group that does these adjustments. Uh, and, and um, you know, the people who've been looking at them, I, I haven't methodologically, but people like Nora Lustig and the co-authors, find there's a lot of it that's unreliable. So, you know, you may you may think this is nerdy or, or, or geeky, and I'm, I'm sure Pfizer is going to chastise me in a moment, but the fact is, um, you know, inequality is, is terribly high, whichever way you look at it, but, you know, exactly how much there is, we don't know. And, and the issue of measurement is a really complicated one. Gabriel said it's not rocket science. I'm not sure. I, I think there's a lot of rocket science in it. Yeah, Jaiti, I mean, I mean, I guess I would say, you know, this is the problem that happens. We get into this conversation and it sounds like, well, it's just too hard. And then it can be sometimes used as an excuse. I wonder like how we, you know, go forward. And I'm going to talk a bit about the, the work being, that has been done between the Centre on International Cooperation at NYU and our colleagues at Oxfam and, and DFI on the kind of political advocacy on this topic. But 
Jaiti, do you want to come in? And just I definitely want to come in, Faisa, yes. I, you know, I'm really worried that we will make the familiar the enemy of the better. Uh, yes, there are problems and there, there are assumptions, but anybody who has looked in detail at how GDP data is collected, in, including in middle income countries like my own, knows exactly how many assumptions go into all of that GDP data collection. In fact, if most people knew how it was collected, they wouldn't touch it with a barge pole because it is full of assumptions. So let's not kid ourselves. Most of our data is full of assumptions. And to pretend that, you know, there are all these wonderful indicators that are set in stone that are really good and reliable and capture a reality. And then there's this other fuzzy stuff that we can't trust because we're familiar with one of them. I think that's a real danger. And I, I would resist that kind of approach completely. I would say, yeah, you have some data. It, we know it doesn't capture reality. Here is another approach that is trying to capture that reality. Yes, it has issues. Think of ways to improve it. Think of ways you can add to it. But most of all, I think Matthew's point is absolutely critical. Think of ways you can collect that data because you know it's an important thing to be caught. You know that it's, an imp uh, that it's essential for countries to actually know and for societies to know what is happening to both income and wealth inequality. So think of the best ways in which you can do that. Instead of saying, oh, you know, we can't do it because it's fun or whoever's doing it is wrong. I, I really do object to that approach. I think there are a couple of positive things that can be done on this with respect to wealth. We, if you actually get every country to go in for looking at asset registers, national asset registers, it, it's not as crazy as it sounds. Data on real estate is already collected. We have property registers. And in fact, many countries can collect property tax. So they're already doing a kind of wealth tax implicitly because it's, it's real estate. But we do have data on some assets. Financial assets increasingly are easier to collect. Sure, we won't be able to capture who owns which yacht, et cetera, et cetera. But if every country brings in regulations about needing to identify the beneficial owners, of all trusts, for example, whereas, which is where a lot of the wealth is secreted. And it's I, this one is really not rocket science. It is political science. You have to identify beneficial owners. Well, hey, the beneficial owners are not going to like it, and they're very powerful, typically, in, in many governments. So definitely, it's possible to create asset registers that capture a significant part of the wealth. And if we can create national registers of wealth, of assets, if we can ask for those to be shared across jurisdictions, you actually have a very different ballgame in terms of at least wealth inequality. For the income inequality, again, you know, it's much easier to track if you really know also where the wealth is being held. And uh, it's not, you know, it is not just the tax data. And one of the reasons why the tax data is also inadequate is because the wealthy are particularly good at avoiding tax. And I say avoiding rather than evading because it's all legal. You can put it through various loopholes. And so I would argue that it's really urgent for a global statistical system, uh, the UN really, to go in for systematic data collection and assisting countries that do not have the capacity to do that through technical and financial assistance in that data collection. I think that's an essential, you cannot improve what you're not tracking. And so I think, you know, creating these metrics is like the first step because then the UN recognizes this is something every country needs to collect. Then you can actually think of a system which enables technical and financial assistance to be provided to all countries. Of course, yes, there's the political constraint. I'm not disputing that at all, but I don't think we should see this as, as a technical constraint. Thank you, Jati. And I, I want to come back to Professor Pano just to say, um, if you're going to ask a question, ask it now, otherwise. Um, and someone called Puru who wrote, it seems like you started a question, but it's not there. If you want to write it in again, that would be great. Um, Professor Pano, please do come in. I can see you're eager to come in. I mean, just a couple of things very quickly. I insist this is not rocket science. It's rocket science politically. And Chico is absolutely right. I mean, politically, this is seriously rocket science. But in the same way, we're getting so much better at measuring the share of the bottom 40. And that was, again, not something so easily. 
we can do a little bit more um, effort uh, than we do about the shadow of the rich. Here, uh, the things that Joatian said, which I agree very much, but she didn't mention the word fiscal paradise, which is the absolute crucial issue here. It's fiscal, I mean, you only need to re read the last book of Gabriel Sugman to realize that how much is, uh, is there in, 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 in fiscal paradise. So even if you improve the register of wealth nationally, well, in London, there are areas on huge areas on London where more than half of the houses are registered in financial paradise. You, don't, you cannot even now make domestic, proper domestic wealth registration because you don't know who owns those fantastic palaces in the center of London. And I think this is very seriously because I think there is nothing that has made more damage to the urgency and to the need to improve inequality than to have false data that give us that false sense of that we are doing something about it. And Chile is probably the top of the list. How the complacency, because supposedly, supposedly, the uh, sorry to go back to the same graph, but supposedly the the, the the Palma ratio and the same the Gini. The Gini has gone, I, I, I have here the, the data, the Gini has to go down the same uh, relative proportion, but when the supposedly the Palma ratio has come down for four, three to three, seven, and this fantastic three years that nothing happened in the country other than the statistical offer, this office deciding to get more serious in how to measure the, the share of the bottom 40%. And also the, this was period of low economic performance in Chile, remember the, the rapid rate of growth in Chile stopped in 98. So these were years of very poor economic performance, no fiscal reform, nothing significantly happened, but suddenly the Palma ratio falling like from three seven to two seven in just three years and everybody feeling uh, nice and uh, basically it took the urgency out of the inequality uh, challenge, the political challenge. So I think is this is seriously wrong, not only academically and theoretically, but also the the political impact of this is 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 quite serious. So I think we have to put much more effort, and and I think that it, the key issue here, of course, is fiscal paradise. How do we get into the into the wealth we the hidden there, the numbers in the Sukman book are, 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 are frightening. And, and of course, there are many other issues about them. But um, I know some people are trying. I know that the World Bank might have a lot of information, but uh, uh, we have to at least try as much to deal with the share of the top 10 as we do trying to improve the share of the bottom 40. Thank you so much, uh, Gabrielle. I just want to, um, Gabriel, I just want to put in a paper in the box for everyone that's written by Matthew Martin that really looks at the difference it makes when you use different measures. So when you take the shared prosperity versus the Palmer versus the Genie and the different picture it gives. Um, I want to come back to you, Chico, and I'm going to come back to everyone in the panel. Um, there was a question here from Amy McShane, which maybe you can see, um, which is basically also what can the the World Bank do on um, gender and human rights. I just want to add there, and this is a really important point that Jaiti and um, Gabriel have both raised, which is that essentially, you know, we have to do more here. The World Bank is in a great position. They already correct, collect a lot of data. You know, they have some of the most talented economists in the world there. You know, they really have that mass of, of understanding and ability. Um, and really just to maybe put this back to, to this moment and the importance of this moment in, in terms of what the World Bank can do going forward. 
Thanks, Faisal. I mean, let me start actually by saying when Jayati said that, you know, she doesn't agree we should make the familiar the enemy of the better or whatever the phrase was, I hope she wasn't talking about what I said, because, you know, what I said was, we know the household surveys are wrong. Um, but no, absolutely, Chico. I was saying that, you know, the fact that the new that measures to uh, attempts to measure the top 10 percent through tax returns and through wealth data, et cetera, are faulty. We know that. But it's better than not having measures. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. And, you know, and also we are we are all OK with GDP, even though I personally have direct experience uh, of a, how extremely problematic that is. Well, yeah, you know, but one especially of the... in middle income countries, it's I mean, the, the uh, numbers of assumptions made are ginormous. Right. And so what we're doing now with uh, the Paris group is we're using those GDP numbers to scale up uh, uh, incomes at the top to distribute about half of national income in Latin America, for example, is not in the household service plus taxes. When you add them, there's half missing and that gets imputed. Uh, and that half is from these national accounts numbers. So, look, I think we all agree that we need to do much more to learn what's really going on. Yeah. Um, certainly what we're doing at the moment is inadequate. We owe Piketty and his group a huge debt for having brought into the open just how wrong uh, we were. But we cannot take what's coming out of these numbers, the, num the blue numbers that, that Gabriel was, I mean, the Palmer ratio numbers in your graph, Gabriel, may be wrong. I am not at all sure that we should take the, the blue numbers of the top 10% as the truth. The fact is, the fact is that there's enormous uncertainty about that as well. You know, there's this Confucius attributed to Confucius to know what you to know what you know and what you do not know. That's true knowledge. The point I'm making is so there is a lot you, that we need to to find. You never out. said that the blue was right. I mean, remember, there's a lot of tax evasion, a lot of problem with that, and also the Chilean government doesn't even let this group of people to get to the raw data. So this is done by some aggregate data. Of course, the blue are not right. Yeah. But the other one is just to look at the, how the discrepancy is growing through time. It's not that there is a discrepancy. It's how it's growing massively. How it, will, it moved from 18 percentage point of GDP to 28 percent of point of GDP in just 20 years. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I think what, what I certainly agree with you guys on is that, you know, there, there needs to be a lot more work. And I agree with Pfizer that the World Bank, uh, in particular, the UN, perhaps the World Bank in particular, is, you know, a great player to, to do that. And in particular, I say, you know, we need a little bit of competition and checks and balances in this market. I mean, at the moment, there's only one large group doing these imputations. Uh, and I think the World Bank should get into it uh, and and we see you know different methods that's how science progresses science progresses by people trying to replicate what other people have done doing it in slightly different ways testing counter testing that's that's how it progresses and i will just say here just to annoy uh, my chairperson even further um i am not really particularly Pfizer. I am not really particularly concerned with whether getting the science right makes it easier or harder for politics you know, I think there's too much inequality almost everywhere, perhaps everywhere, certainly in the countries that Gabriel was talking about. And that's not going to change if the genie is 75 or 65. There's way too much in either case. Now, to pretend that we know the answer because that makes the politics easier is not something I'm going to do. We are at the moment in a world where there is considerable uncertainty about inequality levels in developing countries in particular because of these issues. None of these numbers are perfect. You know, my job is to point that out and try and help fix it in some way. And I think we want the World Bank to do it. What makes it easier for politicians to argue that inequality is high? I don't know. I mean, it's high. It's way too high. We need to reduce it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Chico. That's great. Um, Jati, do you want to come in for final comments? Um, yeah, I, I don't want to get into back and forth with Chico. I think there's a lot of things we agree on. I wouldn't say that I think the World Bank is, uh, you know, the best place to do it because they're so good at everything, I, because there's a lot of things they haven't been that good at. I would say the World Bank has a responsibility to do it. It's really implicit in its charter. 
And it should have been doing this all along. It shouldn't have needed external people to tell it, you know, go out there and think of the best ways to measure inequality and do whatever you can to make sure all the countries can measure it. I, I Frankly, I think that's a no brainer. But I do want to take up the question that was raised uh, by um, uh, Amy McShane about human rights. And this is actually very interesting because I had a discussion with the High Commissioner for Human Rights who is really uh, keen on getting the international financial institutions to be for uh, explicitly integrating human rights into the programming of the international financial institutions. And he has, I think, had a range of preliminary meetings with both the IMF and the World Bank, um, in which it's apparent that it's a kind of new idea for them. And because they've really been concerned with, you know, the macroeconomic indicators, the stability, you know, the usual kinds of things. And so it's going to take a while before, forget gender rights, I mean, the, any kinds of human rights or, and certainly intersectionality actually gets deeply integrated, not just even in the thinking of the top, but in the programming. And I think that's a really big issue, which we should be taking up much more because there is also increasingly, we're talking about discrepancies here, discrepancy between, you know, the, the sort of discussion and the discourse at the in the leadership and the actuality of the programming of the IFIs in which really human rights is not a consideration at the moment. Yeah, and I guess it shows, doesn't it, that it's not a consideration um, in lots of ways. Thank you, Jadi. And um, I'm just thinking, so another thing I do is that I knock on doors on the weekend because I'm running to be a parliamentary candidate in the, in the UK um, for the Labour Party, full transparency. And just to say, as a part-time politician, that it's, you know, the despondency, the importance of this conversation, the amount of times that I'll knock on a door and someone will say to me, well, there's nothing we can do about it. Like, it's so unfair. It's unjust. We know it. But, like, it's just a, just a, a level of despondency that means that, um, you know, the importance of this issue goes way beyond um, just the numbers. It's the importance of... The, the politics is also not just the politics of what's stopping it, it's the politics of um, if we don't measure this, what we get wrong um, and what we don't do going forward and how we don't serve populations in every part of the world. Um, Professor Palmer, do you wanna have a final one minute? Very final one minute in, a, in an issue which for me is the absolutely crucial in all these things is the relationship between we also have to do more work in the relationship between inequality and, uh, and growth. I mean, say, if you are in Brazil and you want to improve, uh, the blue is the market income and the green is the disposable income salt uh, data set. And if you look next to Sweden, I mean, if you talk in Brazil or Chile or anywhere else in the world, more or less, if you want to improve inequality, ah, well, you have to bring down the green one, like the Sweden and Germany and other European countries do. You have to put more on social security, more on this, more on that. More. But what there is so much missing in the in the literature that if Brazil has another option, if, if we look at Taiwan or if we look at Korea, well, they have brought down inequality massively in the market. There is productive strategies. There are <coughs> institutions. There are ways in which we can also bring down the market inequality, the inequality that emerges through market activity. We not only have to move to the Euro so, uh, Western European social democracy type of, in Germany and most of uh, uh, Western Europe, they spend 25% in GDP trying to bring the down the, the market inequality to a disposable income inequality, which is politically uh, politically uh, sustainable. Well, that twenty percent of the GDP doesn't come like mana from the from the from the ceiling, and on top of that, the rich and the corporations don't pay that taxes. So obviously, they're all over hundred uh, percent debt to GDP 
All the rest, everybody knows. But nobody remembers that there is another way to bring down the inequality, which is to do it in the market. And that is the absolutely crucial way, because what happened in Latin America, for example, very quickly, and Chico knows better than me, in Brazil, not only we have the top 10 getting 60% of national income, we don't not only have the 1% getting 20 something percent of national income, we also get private investment as a share of GDP, it hardly gets to 14, 15% of GDP, average is 12. So with this kind of inequality, to have this kind of uh, uh, private investment in GDP, I mean, not surprisingly, we end up with a mess we have in Latin America. But what also we have to- I'm Sorry, we're just, I've got, we've got to end this thing called, just give me a final all, conclusion. We, we really not only have to think how to improve what, what we measure about inequality yeah. and so on, but also to understand the relationship between uh, inequality and productive strategy and market inequality, yeah. which is something that is normally missing in, in this kind of discussion. Sorry about the time, but uh, the mess we we had at the beginning of joining. <laughs> Thank you. So I never had it. I speak a lot in Zoom. I never had it before. I wasn't completely. I apologize for that. But we but, it was great to have you join. And there's people messaging me right now on my phone asking me for your slides. So, you know, it's. Emma, <laughs> Emma was, I was really helpful. Yeah, With thank her, you. I would have never got inside. Well, thank you to the organizers, to Emma and to Peter. Um, just to end just saying that this event was brought to you by the IAI at LSE, but also was done in conjunction with the um, Pathfinders at the Centre on International Inequality um, at, M at the Centre on International Cooperation um, and at NYU and our colleagues Oxfam and DFI. And what we're doing is really also thinking about the political advocacy here. We've had an incredibly passionate argument here about measurement and data and the need to connect that to policy, but we're working on the countries around the world that want to push this. And just to give us some hope at the end of this conversation, you know, there's a number of countries, richer countries, um, you know, middle income, low income countries um, that are coming together from Germany to Sierra Leone and saying that we do want these measures. We need these measures as countries. We want more on inequality. We want this to be more transparent. And um, these often arguments that are used about, you know, it's too hard or there isn't money, we have to put those things aside because too many governments around the world know that if they don't have the measures for these things, if they can't react to the public's anger around these points, if they can't address climate in a way that reduces inequality, if they can't, um, you know, really get into some of these issues of human rights um, and, and deliver for people, then they are going to fail. <laughs> they're not going to be met. They're not going to be voted in again. And so this is um, something that we will be working with as partners and um, going forward. Next week, we have an event in Marrakesh um, with a number of government min ministers around the world to really put the pressure on. This is such a crucial time. We've spent the last kind of seven, eight years using measures that have not captured the types of inequality that are really permeating and causing great destruction to um, questions uh, to, to countries all around the world. I can see people are still writing in the question. I'm sorry that we've run out of time, um, but just to thank the speakers who, yes, again, I just love that it was a passionate argument um, about numbers, who said that you can't be geeky and passionate about things. And I should say, sorry, Chico, you know, I know you think that I'm, um, I love these conversations. I'm a geek too. Um, so thank you to Jayati, thank you to Chico, thank you to uh, Gabriel, and thank you to um, our organisers at III, for, which was a tricky situation today. And thank you to all that have joined uh, and keep in touch. Thank you.